Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here with Steven Schinder. And our I want to say it might be fourth or fifth time offender, Oliver Wake. Uh, I, I think I think that. third, if I remember correctly. Oh, really? Oh, he just makes yeah. it feel like five. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Oliver. How are you? Hi. I'm very well, thank you. How are you guys? <laughs> very I'm good. Starting to, starting to mix up meetings with the actual show. <laughs> yeah, we, ge we generally finish chatting and then talk for another two hours afterwards. Yeah, yeah, it all runs together. But we, we've got some great stuff to cover with Oliver today. We're going to talk about a new CD, which we'll show in a moment as we talk about it. And we're also going to talk about some motion picture soundtrack stuff and the fact that he's going to be the performance and Q&A guest in our Brilliance membership site April 20th. So you want to register for that. There's a link in the post so that you can get all the information, stay up to date with all that stuff. So... Uh, Steve, where do you want to start? Yeah, so first off, today uh, we got the announcement of, you know, the pre-order link of your new solo album, Anamkara, which comes out May 17th. There's a Burning Shed link, which people can click on in the post. So uh, you've been talking about this for the past year or so, but ideas for this album have been bouncing around for a while. Is that correct? Yeah, what I tend to do is I, I'm, I'm always writing and I'm not the sort of artist that writes 12 songs and then goes, there we go, that's an album and shoves them out. <laughs> I, I tend to write songs and then they tend to, f they either find a home or they don't. Uh, and and what happens is I generally sort of magpie things around and put them into a little playlist and think, well, that's that's a nice idea for that sort of record. Um, and for this record in particular, I wanted a, a female vocalist. So it was sort of songs that I'd written from a female point of view or songs that were particularly suited to a female voice. And um, it started many, many years ago. I sort of came up with a couple of songs and a couple of ideas and started working with a, a, a singer called Rachel. But the project never really went anywhere. And we did we recorded a few of the tracks in a sort of a basic form. Um, and then what happened was, is obviously, it was supposed to be my album that I was going to do after... Uh, I think it was after the Mother's Ruin record, about 2007, I think it was. And then I, I got the call to join Yes, and so sort of disappeared off doing that for three or four years. And then started working with Gordon Giltrap, and so wrote the Ravens and Lullabies record with him. And then following that record, there was a, 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 a few, couple of years gaps of lots and lots of sessions. And then I ended up doing um, the From a Page Yes record. Right. Uh, which took quite a bit of time to to pull together, as you can imagine. And then it was, um, then I suddenly got lots of people going, oh, we haven't heard this album for a while. So then I got involved in all the box set reissues. And so that sort of took up a load of time with a load of other sessions as well. And then I got to 2023 or 2022, late 2022. And I was talking to, to my management and they said, we need a new record from you. It's been too long since we've had a new record. And so I went, I've got this record I really want to do. It's like a Celtic rock prog thing. And they were like, oh, it sounds interesting. So we talked about it and went through a few iterations of how it could work. And they gave me the green light to get started on it. And so then it was this sort of looking at these sort of collections of songs that I'd written over the years for this, this project. And I did that traditional thing of thinking, oh, great. It's pretty much done. And then started to go into the music and actually realized that actually it wasn't done by any stretch of the imagination. So I sort of pulled everything apart, rewrote an awful lot of it. Um, and then was lucky enough to sort of choose some wonderful musicians to play on the record. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was great. And so it sort of then just took on a life of its own and um, did that usual thing with records where you think, I oh, probably won't be too tricky. I, I seem to remember that <laughs> writing records isn't too tough. And then you get into the, into the weeds and you suddenly realize that it's actually an awful lot of, an awful lot more right. work than you remember. It's, I think it's a bit like children. You have a child and then about three, four years later, you go, oh, I don't think it was that bad, actually. And you sort of forget all the uh, <laughs> sleepless nights <laughs> and <laughs> stuff you go through. I think it's a bit like that with records. You start, ah, oh, write another record. And then you yeah. get into it, you suddenly go, oh, yeah, I remember why we don't do these that often. <laughs> well, it's, it's also you make a really neat analogy with having a child because they say that childbirth for women is the quickest pain you forget. Yeah. It's kind of like you go through all that, you know, gestating it, creating it, recording it, mixing that, you know, all that. And then after 
all that anguish is over with, like you said, you look back, it's like, yeah, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's true. But um, and then you, you you have the difficulty of living with it for a while because it's mixed and it's finished, and then you suddenly go, Oh god, you actually get you have to give it a bit of time away, and then you come back and go, you can listen to it. I listened to it today, actually. I hadn't listened to it for a for a few weeks. And my wife and I went out for a, a, a walk in the countryside and we took took the record and listened to it in the car. And it was like, oh, it's actually really nice to listen to it as as a listener rather than constantly critiquing and thinking, well, what yeah. have I got to change next? So that was that was really good today. Uh, so that's where the record came from originally. And um the title Anam Cara has been around for a long time. It's 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 depends where you read it. Some people say it's early Irish and some say it's middle Irish, but it's, it, it technically translates into soul friend oh, is, is what it means. Um, and it seems like a, it's not a concept album as such, but it's uh, an album of, it, it's, it's an, it's an album that has a, a sort of theme to the whole record. It's all about that relationship between people. So there's lots of sort of, I sort of call them short stories or vignettes about, different types of relationships and things with within people and little short stories so that's that's really where it where it comes from nice the cover's beautiful talk about the cover who came up with that and who oh, put it together? It's, it's a very very good friend of mine called ann sudworth she is the most amazing artist well i, I say the most amazing artist because then it makes it sound like all the other artists i work with aren't I mean, one of the amazing artists that i've been lucky enough to work with i, I work with rodney matthews who's also the most amazing artist you know and yeah. Roger Dean, who's also the most amazing artist. And he's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's gorgeous, though. It really is. It's very enchanting looking, and it makes me want to listen to the music. Just she, like if that was yeah, a book cover, I would want to dive in, you know? Yeah, she um, she also did the cover for my Three Ages of Magic record back in oh. 2003. Uh, 2003? I think it was about 2001, maybe. 2001. Oh, yeah, blind. early 2000s, somewhere around there. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, he's real good with this stuff. He's like a date lexicon. And Oliver, regarding the cover, did the two of you collaborate? Did she have music to work she, off? No, of? it's it's really odd. She um I, I talk to Anne quite regularly. She's um she doesn't do album covers or many album covers or anything like that. She just basically does her own work for what she wants to do. And oh. she has lots of sort of A-list film stars that go and buy her work. And back in the early 2000s, I saw a picture of hers on the internet. And, um, I, you know, I was obviously feeling particularly brave. Maybe it had been a bottle of Budweiser too many or something. And I <laughs> I wrote to her website and I just said, I'm doing this record. And I think you've done a piece of artwork that would be superb for the front cover. Could I could I use it? And wow. and we And she said, for some reason, she said yes. And she's never wow. said yes to anybody else. <laughs> she said yes. And and then we met up and we became really good friends and we we catch up at least once a year. And um, you know, she sends little prints to my kids for their birthdays and stuff. And so she's a she's a lovely person. And then when it came to doing this record, um, I've all you know, I've got her books on my back shelf, and I'm always going through her artwork. And I came across this piece of piece of work, and I thought, oh, that is particularly beautiful i particularly loved the the coloring of it and, and the and the and the fairy yeah and thought that i said to, to my wife i said that would be brilliant for the cover and then i i went to Anne and i i sort of said look you know there's a piece of artwork of yours i'd really love to use and she was and she just straight away said yeah yeah of course you can and it was like wow so <laughs> it's only too second, easy yeah. <laughs> it, it was just you know it's it's lovely and it just i'm a real artwork is so important to me on a record because it, it really sets the tone of the record it really sets the the feel that you're going to get from the music and yeah, exactly. and and this this album cover did that for me she's done some wonderful artwork for the inside cover as well oh, and great. she is just she's just phenomenal anybody go out there have a look at Anne Sudworth's work and it's just it is just amazing and so a lot of pastel work it's the detail for pastel is remarkable um, beautiful yeah so, so i was very very lucky that she let me use some more artwork of hers on the cover yeah but she's but she's amazing and the oddly odd thing about it was is um i found this picture in, in one of her books and then i was looking through her other books because i've got books at the back because i'm 
I'm very lucky. Obviously, I've got lots of musician friends, but I'm very good friends with Peter Brokownik, who's done covers for me, and Rodney Matthews, who I've worked with for many years, and Roger Dean, obviously, who's I've done the Yes work with. Right. And so and I've got Anne's books. So I've got all their art books behind me. And um, I found another of her books, which I was looking through, which I hadn't looked through for a while. And oddly enough, the, the picture that I used for Three Ages and the picture for Anne Cara were on the facing pages. I literally opened the book, and they were both there next to each other. And oh, like, wow. Well, how perfect is that? You know, that's yeah. a real, real serendipitous moment. Yeah, I was just going to say that. That's actually pretty remarkable if you yeah, think about it. It is. So yeah. have you looked at the artwork on the back of either of those pages to see if that might fit a, a no, future I should, album? No, I shouldn't. I should find, <laughs> find the next couple of albums. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And you'll be performing, performing some of the material from this uh, with a band on Sunday, April 14th, which I can't April. believe how right around the corner that feels, oh, right? Know. Tell me about it. It's um, terrifying. I've got a yeah, piano at here, Winters music, and, which I'm trying to learn. Yeah, time just... Um, that's at Winters and Prague Rock Festival and yeah. Chapter Drill Hall. How much of this album can we expect? We're going to do th uh, about four songs from this album. And we're doing uh, the four songs from, from a page. But we're going to do the oh. turn of a card track we're going to do in the style that we did for the ravens and lullabies record which is where it originated well it didn't originate but it originated with yes but then got arranged for ravens and lullabies there's a whole history behind that track so we're going to do it's going to do those tracks um uh, it was a bit a bit sort of odd really because stephen lamb who organizes the festival phoned me up um last year and said um you know would you would you headline a show because we i headlined the show with gordon giltrap uh many years ago Mm -hmm. And he said it'd be great if you could come and do it. And he said, "And would you would you play from a page?" And I said, "Yeah." I said, "But I don't want to do just a yes set. I don't want to do a set full of yes music. I, if I'm going to do some stuff, I'll do from a page." Yeah. Um, and then he said, "Well, what else are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm working on this project, and it's called Anam Cara, and it's I don't know whether the it's you know it's a band or it's me or whatever. It ended up being my my sort of solo record, but it's got sort of such a nice tight band on it. I sort of think of them as my band for this record and so, so it sort of got promoted as oliver waitman's adam car plays from a page so it's a bit, <laughs> a bit confident oh, wow. <laughs> but it's it's essentially we're playing some tracks from the new record it was a good opportunity to tell people there's a new record coming out and that play awesome. some of the yes stuff which people would want to hear and then there's a load of stuff from the back catalog that we're going to throw into the mix as well a couple of tracks from jabberwocky and hound and oh uh, nice bits, bits from three ages and uh some other tracks are in the Ravens record. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a fun, a fun show, but it's a, it's, it's quite a lot to learn. You, you Again, like, you know, doing shows when you're out there touring and playing shows night after night after night, it's all yeah. under your fingers. But when you do one off headliners, it's a, it's a lot to learn and get under your fingers quite quickly. So it's, um yeah. So the piano is just so they're covered with sheet music and things. Yeah. Is there a chance this show could go on the road and maybe even come to North America? Oh, we would love it to. It's just going to depend on how the album does. If if the Adam Gara album does well and people buy it and there's a there's a good response to it and there looks like there's audiences, then I will I will take it wherever people want to hear it. But it's that's uh, great. Well, here's uh, someone Diane Kelly who wants to see it in Atlanta. So you got to start. There we go. That's one yeah. person in an audience. We're there. We're and, up, we're, and up and, we're up and running. <laughs> yes, people see it in LA. I'll see it in Phoenix. And um, yeah, that would really, it sounds like a great set. That combination of all that music is very well rounded. It will yeah. be. I've got a very, a very good band as well. I'm very lucky. Yeah. The, the musicians that I've got, I've got um, Hayley Griffiths is my vocalist for this, this uh, uh, show. And she plays on the record. She's, um, she's a wonderful singer and, the reason I chose Haley for the for the record was because she'd done a lot. Of, I'd worked with her before, but she did um, a lot of the singing on the original River Dance and the Lord of the Lord oh. of the Dance shows. She she was one of the vocalists on that, so she has a really good sort of Celtic um, uh, ability. But she's also a rock singer, and she's also a soprano, so she's oh. in classical as well. And the way that I write music, which tends to be a little all over the place having somebody that can hit notes and then suddenly change style quickly is you know is fantastic 
so yeah, so That's she's great. one of, and I've got Oliver Day doing the um guitars. Uh some of your listeners might remember him from doing the, the fragile yes tribute band. And he's a right. he's he's a remarkable uh player. He does all the acoustic stuff on the record, but he's doing all the guitars on the show. Um but no, he was terrific, you know. We were coming up with things and I'd written all these sort of keyboard lines. I said, I want these on a on a guitar. And he's like, Well, he said, I've got a lute. We could probably do part of it on a lute and part of it on a oh, mandolin. Wow. So he ripped out mandolins, lutes, tenor lutes, um, lap nice. steels, you know, and anything we could anything we can get our hands on, he he, he plays if it's got a string. So yeah, so it's fantastic. So he he's playing as well. So it's um yes, yeah, so it's a very a very very good band i've got um dan nelson from magenta playing bass and scott heim who's who was from the band pendragon playing drums for me as well so yeah. a, a phenomenally good band playing live uh, and and then on the record i've got um uh troy dinocoli from nightwish doing all the whistles and Ilian pipes uh my friend uh robert mcclung from the rock band telegies doing all the violins and um uh, a chap from England called Mick Allport, who I don't think he's done a major amount of recording, but he's mm-hmm. phenomenal sax play. He's done some wonderful sax and clarinet on the record as well. So it's it's been an album of of just being able to use lots and lots of different sounds and pull lots of different styles of music together. It's been great fun. I mean, it's been terrific. Yeah, and one of our uh, viewers uh, really likes the. the That's concept. great. I really hope it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, uh, sir, here's, uh, away, or? yeah, just a little. Sorry. Uh, Robert Nasir says, great to see Oliver on the show. Thank you for this. Adam Kara, soul friend, soul mates can. Aha. Uh-huh. Your experience is such beautiful and powerful again. Yeah. What's the date of the, the release again? It's, it's uh, pre release is out today. So it could be pre ordered today. And it's coming out on May the 17th. Yeah. Okay. Which is great because it's day before my dad's birthday, so that's his present sorted. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, yeah. So, are you? Uh, are you? Gonna... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I, Steve. Go ahead. I was just gonna say <laughs> it, um, it's gonna be great, like you being able to play this music at the festival. So, like you said, from a page, like what? what how does it feel finally bringing the from a page? material to a live setting after all this time yeah complicated (laughs) (laughs) oh really (laughs) (laughs) well it's it's um it just it brought back a lot of memories as to how complex yes music was Mm -hmm. and it's it's and it's not so much in the the parts that you play sometimes that are complex although they can be a little tricky it's the intertwining of the of the parts Mm -hmm. and how you have to play your part sort of listening to what the other person's doing whilst not being distracted by what's the other person's doing because you can often be cross rhythms or or playing against each other yeah. so that is that is the hardest bit and um but oliver and what, I, oh, go what, on. i'm sorry oliver what's a song that would be most challenging in that area um it depends really on the type of song i mean gift of love is challenging because it's quite long Mm-hmm, and it, it mm-hmm. does a lot of repeating of themes in different keys. So you've sort of got to get it into your head and try and remember all these different keys. And also there's an awful lot of layered keyboards and an awful lot of layered guitars on that. So trying to strip it back to actually work with a five-piece band is, is quite tricky. Mm-hmm. Um, so that will be interesting to do. Um, words on a page is is not tricky as such to play. It's the intricacies that, that's, that's tricky with that. It's getting the acoustic guitar and the piano to just intertwine perfectly which is what Mm. so that has its own challenge and then you have something like to the moment that has a lot of uh parts where we all sync up into different bits you know oliver and i were playing um together the other day we just did a quick online thing together and we were sort of doing the final chorus and the keyboard solo and that whole part at the end where it all joins up and syncs together and we, we sort of got that together and thought okay that's good so it's there's different challenges that that come from it um and there's another section in the middle of to the moment where the keyboard's sort of doing a do it's like a lot of finger swapping yeah. and it's it, all the fingers swap in different orders so it's not just a diddle diddle easy you sort of unders and then your seconds and then you're suddenly starting on your third so there's yeah. a lot of that going on and in the background you've got Oliver going diddle 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 diddle, and your brain's trying not to get pulled into one direction into that one. yeah keep it keep it together and I, it suddenly reminded me of all these times when we used to play things like 
close to the edge and stuff and you're sort of going god this rings but but then it in an odd way it sort of made me go oh actually that's interesting because we were that's what yes makes you do it makes you write like that it makes you write yeah. this this counter melody stuff going on all the time and that that's you know so it's challenging in in lots of different ways but that's awesome fun. and if you get you know if it ever becomes too challenging just do what your dad has done for years and just mime to recordings <laughs> 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 just kidding everybody just kidding <laughs> um here's a comment from a viewer uh kevin says love to the moment oh thank you that's very yeah, kind that's a great song yeah yeah Absolutely. for sure yeah and, and speaking of or go ahead steve oh no go ahead well i was gonna say speaking of your dad last year you guys and other amazing musicians were involved in uh called the other coronation concert and yeah. you'll be doing another one uh the mile of roses charity concert in i think that's in june tell it us is, a bit about yeah. that well the, what happened was a couple of uh, a couple of years ago we decided to do um uh, a charity concert for a couple of schools uh one school that was close by to us another one that was a school for special needs children and mm -hmm. um so we did that that came up with this idea uh, and it was going to originally be my dad and I just doing it together. And then um, we got involved with a theatre called the Roses Theatre who in, in Tewkesbury, which is a quite an old um, picturesque uh, uh, British sort of, I, I suppose, uh, sort of how a lot of people would imagine a, a, a British medieval type city to look, you know, or Tudor city mm -hmm. to look, lots of beams and stuff, very picturesque place. And they've got a lovely theatre there and they um, said that they would put the show on. And then we sort of talked about that and I talked about how we were going to do the set. And then we sort of talked about other people that could do it. And I got Gordon Giltrap involved and um, Carrie Martin came along, a lovely uh, singer. And th that show was, we the only date they had free was the date of the King's coronation in the UK. And they were already doing a big coronation concert called the, the Coronation Concert. Oh, oh, you know, unsurprisingly enough. And um, we thought, yeah. oh, well, what can we, what can we do? So we, I, I, in, <laughs> inventively came up with the title of the other coronation concert and that's how it sort of came as a joke and then it became the title of the concert so we did that show we sold it out rodney matthews came along and we auctioned off some of his artwork and um oh. it was great and we raised quite a lot of money for the schools uh and then this year we're doing it again for the special needs school basically uh, we, we said that we should do it again and um actually his dad and i were bowing at the end of the show he said oh we should do this again so I, you know, I, that's great. My, my memory is appalling, but sometimes it's pretty good. And I remembered when I saw him last time and said, Dad, you said you'd do another one. Do you want to do it? And he said, yeah, I'll go on. So he said, we'll do one more. Uh, and this one's for the school, which is called the Milestone School. And then uh, it's also for the Roses Theatre themselves. So that's why the Mile of Roses came from as a, as a title. Oh. So that's going to be similar to last year's, although this show will involve um, – me playing a lot more across the sets last year we sort of did individual sets with just very little uh, a couple of little accompaniment sections yeah uh, but this year i'll do some songs with dad i'll play a bit with gordon i'll play with carrie and carrie will probably play with me and my set as well so well it's, it'll be a development of last year's show but it should be good fun i mean they, they're great fun they sold out it sold out last year quite quickly and i think we're nearly three quarters sold out already we only announced it a couple of weeks oh. ago so that's yeah. awesome. And here's uh, some more comments on your work. Dan also says, I yeah. love Three Ages. Three Ages. Well, thank you very much. Yes, that Three was ages. a that was a great fun album to do. It was recorded yeah. in a in an old barn in um uh, if you know England at all, the pointy bit at the bottom on the yeah. left hand side is um <laughs> down in Cornwall, which is real sort of fairy folklore celtic land as well as you know sort of the irish and the scottish that cornwall has the same sort of folklore to it and um i recorded it there in a, in a there was a farm and they'd recorded this they they'd started to build a studio in this barn huge great barn and their plan was to build a studio so they built a control room in the middle and then they were going to refurbish all the rooms that were around this oh. control room uh, and they said, oh, come down. It'll be sorted. It'll be brilliant. And I turned up and the control room was pristine and beautiful. And every other room was like a barn. And I said, oh, what, wow. happened to all, what happened to all the, the rooms? And they said, we found bats. And <gasps> in oh, England, wow. the bats are protected, so you can't move them. So they couldn't do any of the building. But oh. he said, 
but are you still okay to record? And I said, yeah, why not? So we set up keyboards and guitars all over the place in all these rooms, had a big Leslie speaker for the Hammond organ just sitting in the middle of this massive barn and um, recorded it there. It was wonderful. And I always remember I had a little, it was before, I didn't use a Moog on the record. I used an old Yamaha CS1 single oscillator uh, keyboard. Which, oh. um, and what I did is I double tracked it to make it sound like it had two oscillators, detuned it the second time I played the same solo twice. But when I was doing that solo, the sound engineer said to me, he said, there's something wrong with your keyboard. And this, obviously this barn is in the riddle of a massive, great dairy farm. And he said, something wrong. Every time you're playing it, he said, we keep getting a click keeps coming through. And I went, well, it's odd. It doesn't normally do that. Um, so we kept going on it. And then we found out that it was actually the voltage from the electric fence that was keeping the cows in the field. Oh, wow. From escaping that was actually coming through on the voltage through the keyboard. The electric fence, basically. Yeah, yeah basically. So what I, they said to me, is said, look, we can turn off the electric fence for about a minute before the cows will try to escape. So you've got to nail the solo in one. Oh, that's well, hilarious so yeah so i actually had to turn <laughs> all the electric fences for this farm so i could get my solo done it was great that is yeah i bet the acoustics of the barn having been been left as is were probably pretty good right with all that old wood oh, and was it, it just was a beautiful. hard dirt floor maybe yeah some yeah it was beautiful alpha. it was it was so much fun it was such a lovely environment to work in as well yeah, that's just, neat yeah it's it's also funny that we always say old barn I don't think anyone's building any new barns that, that I know of, right? I can't picture a new <laughs> barn. They're all old barns. <laughs> yeah, particularly over here. Yeah, they're all old barns. It's lovely. <laughs> but it's, 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 it was just something really lovely about driving, going to work in the countryside, just driving through the middle of nowhere, down yeah. into the valley, finding an old farmstead and sitting there and, and recording music. It was lovely. That's awesome. I love that kind of drive. Um, I want to show, here's kind of a longer comment, but let's go ahead and put it on the screen. Robert also says, Oliver, uh, your respect for Yes and your willingness to present the Yes music you've created during a period in which membership decisions may have been pragmatic and less than just is inspiring. It cannot be overstated the importance of having some Exemplars, examples, let's say, of graciousness in progressive rock. Thank you for this. You know, that's that's a really good point. You know, I think there's a reason why, you know, stereotypes are built on reality. I think that's fair to say. Stereotypes are built on some degree of reality. And I think we all know that, um, especially before YouTube and, and all of that, when people couldn't really get that peek beyond the curtain of musicians of any genre of music, people in the area of progressive rock fusion, musos were looked at as, well, they've got to be snooty. So when we see, you know, all these wonderful layers and traces of humility, it, it, it means a lot because it, it bursts that sometimes shadowed bubble that people have of people um, in certain genres of music, just like in film, you know, or anything like that, that uh, they didn't realize before. So that indeed is really cool. That's nice. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Yeah. No, it's, um, I, I just, <sighs> there was two ways of playing that situation, which was get angry or look at it and go, well, that was a great opportunity. Yeah. That was, I got to do an awful lot of wonderful things that a lot of musicians don't get to do and be yeah. thankful for it and then build something from that. Uh, yeah. And, and I think, you know, taking that approach helped me get to do the From a Page project. So many yeah. years later, it allowed me to do something that maybe, you know, had it played out a different way, wouldn't have been so appealing to to the other guys. But, um, you know, I, it was when I did the, uh, when I worked on the From a Page stuff, I, you know, I was talking to, to the management, who also my management and Yes's management, and um, they said, I think you need to come down and talk to Steve, you know? So I went down to Steve's house and sat there and played in the music. And it was like old times, you know, it was like years had just disappeared. We just sat there. And then yeah. we started talking about loads of other stuff and was chatting away. And, um, and we chat every now and then, and every now and then I'll, he'll just drop me an email and say, Hey, let's have a, let's have a call or I'll give him a call out of the blue. And, uh, you know, we catch up like we used to, you know, it's, it's, 
things things happen in life. I'm not a, I'm not very good at being angry. I'm not a, I'm not really a, <laughs> not really an angry person. And I, I find it, I, I find and I find it uh, a lot of issues or things that come out for me or, or problems or, or things that annoy me tend to come out in song. In in and I write I generally write a story around something. Mm -hmm. You know, every musician writes something and you, you know, you always tend to write from a personal perspective because something's happened to you and then you write. And that's how I right. deal with it. It's, it's like cathartic. You you write music and it helps you, you know, put your thoughts out there that may be a bit um, uh, non-identifiable to other people, but it allows you to get your your thoughts and your feelings, your feelings out. Yeah. And I find that a much more creative way of dealing with things that are maybe difficult or you know, uncomfortable situations. You know, that's a great point. Um, I've been a fan of Phil Collins since before he became Genesis's lead singer. And uh, listening to his autobiography a couple of months ago um, on Audible was just so revealing to exactly like that point. Like, oh, this song's about that situation. This one's about yeah. her. This one's about himself and his own you know, little mishap, you know, he was very, very open about it in the book. I don't know if you've read it or heard it, but no, it's yeah. And, and there were moments where it seemed like he was kind of self-conscious and shy about certain things in his career, you know? Yeah. Very, he couldn't have been more, I, I don't think he couldn't have been more open and just putting himself out there. It's really interesting. So what you just said reminds me of that. And like you said, the the listener, the fan often doesn't really know, you know, which song yeah. is a song for the sake of a song, which one is an emptying out of emotions in that way, rather than, like you said, being angry. And when yeah. we show gratitude for things, we get more of what we're showing gratitude for. And that's exactly what happened with From a Page. Yeah. 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 I just and noticed your t-shirt spells out Kara. Oh, does the, it? The middle four letters. Oh, yes. I thought you'd done it deliberately. Oh, uh, yeah. He, his shirt, for those listening, says sarcasm, and it's like on a periodic table. Style. Yeah. So, yeah. The letters that the, are in car are yeah. on that. Yeah. I could just see the CA and the RA, and I thought, oh, sarcasm yeah, may, may occur yeah. periodically. There you go. Uh, <laughs> if you don't I believe think... me, just ask me, or ask my wife, or ask Steve, for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was me thinking you'd done it deliberately. <laughs> yeah. you, you also um mentioned rodney matthews with whom you collaborate with now and then um is there anything you've been working on with him recently or upcoming that you're able to talk about yeah we're we're working on um two two things three things four things um the fourth one yeah, that was Monty python right there <laughs> oh I was, I was thinking like it's Pretty not sure. like a children's book. It like oh, yeah, he, I love it. <laughs> he just phones me up every now and then, and, and so basically, we're, we're working on the. We did Trinity a few years ago, um, which was a, an album with Jeff Sheets, a wonderful guitarist, and we're going to do a follow up to that. So Jeff started writing for that. I've started writing for that. So we are doing that as another big project. Um, there will be a follow up to the Endor film that I did the soundtrack for. Um, for him a few years ago he's doing a, another yendor film so i'm going to do the soundtrack for mm -hmm. that uh and then we're doing um another cd one track thing for something um but then the, the thing that i'm working on at the moment is for a project called squid which was his band from the 70s basically he before oh, wow. rodney was um well known for an artist he was a drummer in mm -hmm. uh prog bands back in back in the 60s he played at glastonbury and did quite a lot of stuff and um then he had to make a choice between music and art and he obviously went down the art route and then for many years he always wanted to get back into doing drumming and so he did trinity and, and things and then he said to me he said um i've got these recordings that the the band did back in the 70s for a for a radio um show uh they never got signed but they recorded a few tracks and he said I'd really like to to do these and write some new stuff into these songs and bring them, you know, get them redone. So I've been working through all these old tapes and recordings and re-recording a load of these parts and mm. trying to work out the songs and writing new sections for it. And so we're, we're doing that. Rodney's in the studio tomorrow, actually doing the drums for one of the tracks. So that's been really, really good fun because it's been lovely to, you know, go back to just being, 
Hammond, Moog, and piano like it was seventies again. So it's been good fun. Oh, so nice. Yeah, so we're doing we're doing that at the moment. So that's that'll be that'll be good fun. So that's the next thing that will come out um, for from Rodney from Rodney's world. Um, that's neat. Kind of bringing it back in time as far as the mm. soundscape with the instruments you're using, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I we would and we're writing new music for it. Um, but of course, I want to write in the style of of how the original band was. And I, that, you know, it's one thing I actually really enjoy doing. It, you know, when I wrote the stuff with Yes, I tried to write stuff that I felt would be in keeping with how Yes would write music and the sort of things that they would bring to the table. So the songs that I brought to the table with Yes were songs that I felt were Yes like in composition. So it's it's good fun to go and write in a in a certain way. So I'm looking forward to this sort of not being constrained by only using three or four instruments, but thinking of it as a how you would have had a setup at that in those days rather than you know something like three ages where i just surrounded myself with as many different things that had flashing lights on as possible and yeah random, <laughs> randomly programming and all that yeah. <laughs> yeah that's cool that's nice yeah. yeah i love that those instruments are still just so relevant you know yeah well they're good fun to play i mean they are just there's an identity that you get from that those instruments i, I you know I always will love a Moog because, you know, it's part of my heritage is dad playing with Moogs and yeah, and I, I love my little Moogs that I've got. Um, but Hammond organs are just wonderful. You know, it's just a tremendously, they, what's the best way of putting it? Guitars look interesting and cool. They look great. Guitars look interesting and cool. Keyboards often don't. They, right. they you know, sometimes keyboards, I've got a little, uh, get my camera right there's a chronos in the background there which is a cool yeah, chronos right. it's the special edition red version which makes it look a little bit different and that they, they look nice and my white piano down here which is my dexabel piano looks really nice it's unusual but in general there was a period of time where keyboards were just flat black things yeah exactly, with black and white keys real and, utilitarian look yeah with guitars you'd get like all these different paint jobs yeah yeah, yeah. vanity yeah. instrument like drums yeah. yeah, and yeah. The, what I liked when I went out with Yes as well, I did it deliberately, was every keyboard on that rig was had a role, you know. So there were a couple of synths that did synth roles. There was a big workstation that did a sort of workhorse of a lot of stuff. But there was a dedicated piano that did piano and roads, and then there was an organ that just did the organ bits, and then there was a, a Moog, and there was a little vocoder, and they all had specific roles to try and, allow me to, to sort of play in the style of the music of the era of yes that we were playing at that particular right. time and i'm i'm a big i'm a big fan of that and i know a lot of people go out now with one keyboard and a laptop and that's great if that, that works for a lot of people but i've sort of come from this world of playing um i'm not i've, I've only ever taken a laptop out once and that was purely because there was a nicer piano sound in the laptop that i just <laughs> You know, played through to the piano because it was a it was a nicer piano sound than I had in the keyboard. That was all I, right. I did it for. Um, but I admire a lot of these keyboard players that can go out and they have all these samples and fires and things that they're firing off all the time. And I remember many years ago, there was a show we did with with Yes, and we were played we played a festival, and it was quite a big festival. Uh, I can't remember any thousands of people. It was ten thousand people or something. It, it, and we played on this stage. And next to us was this huge arena. And um, and we finished the show and we looked to the side and there was a load of people stood by the side of the, the stage and we didn't recognize them. Oh, who's that lot? And um, one of the, uh, the tour manager or somebody said afterwards said it was the X Factor were in the arena next door, oh. and one of these pop idol things, one of those sort of reality things. Yeah. And they'd finished and come over to watch a bit of the Yes show, a couple oh, of the wow. artists. And they spent the entire time sort of apparently going, where are the other musicians? Are they under the stage? They couldn't believe that it was just the five of us. Just That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah. and it just showed the difference in that sort of approach of, of musicianship. And there's, you know, I don't have anything, you know, I, it's not a criticism of how other people work. Other people right. do how they work in, in the way that they have to do certain songs and certain pieces of music. You You couldn't do it like that. But. Yeah. It was it was just that difference in approach and styles to doing things. So I've always been a little bit slightly, maybe make my life harder than it needs to be. I could probably make it a lot easier, but I'm yeah. I'm a bit of a bit of a player. My keyboard tech always, or people always say to me, "What do you think of this keyboard?" And it's like I switch it on, and if the sounds make me want to write, then that's great. Then if they don't, I, I move on. I, I'm not really a 
I'm not really a techie sit down and program yeah. lots of different sounds. I've probably done a couple in my life, probably a couple in my Moog, which is a bit more fun. But right. I tend to be more of a player that gets inspired by something. And then I tend to go off on this little meandering path until a song comes out of it. Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of players, you know, some of the, some of them do wonderful things with sounds that I could never even think of. That's what makes us all different. You know, we all do everything. Everybody does things differently. Yeah. We yeah. each have our own way of working. Yeah. 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 There's a uh, story I'm going to ask you to tie here. What hopefully won't be a dog emergency. I'm going to disappear for a minute, but Glenn says, Always enjoyed the story about Oliver and dad's autographs. Why don't you talk about that? And I will be back. That autographs. This is, a, it's, I imagine this is along the lines of that. They look quite similar. Um, I did. Well, my... uh, well, I've heard like how I've heard one story of how you helped uh, some, I don't know if this is the same person or someone else, but how you helped someone uh, get an autograph from your dad so i don't know if that refers to that or the what you think it might be but yeah, i don't just, know yeah uh, can I don't glenn, know. <laughs> maybe glenn can elaborate about which story i should tell <laughs> right <laughs> um yeah i don't know but i, I guess just whatever comes to mind that well there is there is because i've done a lot of yes records which i've signed over the years and um people have commented that that dad's signature and my signature aren't too dissimilar oh. uh, and there is a reason i did my signature I, I worked my signature out when i was eight eight years old i did my signature and decided to stick with it and the reason i did the signature in a similar sort of style was because my dad had told me a story that he had copied his signature from his dad and he had done a version of his of his dad's signature so basically my granddad's signature my dad copied and, and made a variation of it for his signature and so i thought at the age of eight or nine whenever it was when you first start trying to do signature i thought oh well that'd be really nice if granddad did the signature and then dad did it similarly that would be nice if i do something a variation of it again and we keep the same signature going down through various generations so it's oh, neat. Yeah, it's one of those things where people just probably look at it and go, oh, he's just copied his dad. It wasn't. It was actually a, a nice sort of family story behind it that I thought was 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 quite good. My son's been coming up to me recently saying, how do you do it, dad? So I think at some point he's going to probably. <laughs> he's on to it. But yeah, just his to be the same. Okay, yeah. Agree. Yeah, Glenn says, uh, yes, he signed something your dad signed and they looked similar. That's the story yeah. you told. Thanks. Yeah, he has a, he has a double loop on the W. I don't do the double loop. I just do. Oh, I think he has three. I only do two. And um, I think if you look at the O, my O sort of has the loop on the inside. He does his R with the loop on the outside. And my granddad did it. His, my granddad was Cyril. So he did a C. So he did the big loop as well. So. Anyway, that was a story that my dad told me back when I was a kid, and that's why I thought I'd keep it going. So that's that's the story behind the signatures. That's, that's awesome. Great. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. Um, I want to show another comment. Dogs are okay, by the way. We have three pretty good-sized dogs, and my wife has customers coming in and out for what she does, and sometimes one of them goes off, and then it's a domino effect. It just sounded a little mm -hmm. too crazy, so I, I had to peek. Um, Peter. Says, looking forward to Oliver's new album. I wonder which track or moment on it turned out the best or closest match to what Oliver imagined. That's an interesting question. And were there any huge surprises far from what you imagined that you ended up being very happy with? Yeah, there is one. There's one song which I'd always really liked. It's there's a track called Here in My Heart off the record. And it was originally written as a a sort of a, a Celtic refrain, really. It sort of did a, a very similar sort of rolling melody that went through the piece of music. Mm -hmm. And I wrote five or six verses doing this in a sort of canon way. And, and it was just like a little riff section, then this verse canoning. And then as I started to, to work on the music for it, I started to develop it more. And the music got more and more intricate and then i bought violins and my friend robert did some wonderful violin stuff on it and then it was like okay and then what about if we bring some drums in and then so the, the the drums came in and we built it up more and then troy did some alien pipes that we put at the beginning and then it was like okay and then the pipes can come back in actually you know i need a solo now so then i 
switched on the Moog and I remember it was a one take one night. I did this solo and thought, oh, that's all right. I'll keep that. And um, and then suddenly the music became much more than the than the song originally was supposed to be. And it, we got to the album. We finished it. I'd had it mixed with Haley singing the original vocal line to it. And I was about, we were a few days away from the master. And I remember sort of sitting, listening to the, the album and thinking, something's not right. Something's not quite right here. And it reminded me of a, a story that I told about John Wetton. Uh, John and I were, were very good friends. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people often say to me, you know, what question you often get asked is, did, did he give you advice? Yes, he gave me lots of advice. But one piece of advice that he never gave me that I just took from the way he wrote was that he was um, annoyingly good at writing verses. His verses were almost as good as his choruses. You listen to one of his songs and you sing along with it from start to finish. Whereas, you know, my, my wife played me a song today by somebody famous from the 80s and I listened to it and she said, do you know this song? And I listened to it and I thought, so I've never heard this before in my life. The verse was instantly forgettable. And then it got to the chorus. And I went, oh, yeah, I probably have heard this somewhere along the line because you only <laughs> remembered the chorus. Right. John Wetton always had this ability to write verses that were so brilliant. Yeah. And, and that has always been in my head whenever I've written music. I've always gone, is that verse good enough? Does yeah. it build to the chorus? Does it have the right... Um, feeling of of melodic development is it is it catchy does it make people want to sing along does it tell a story you know it's a whole raft of things that you do when you write a piece of music um i i always liken it to crafting an owl out of a piece of wood i can take a piece of wood and chip away at it and make it look a bit roughly like an owl but it takes a somebody to craft it to make it really look like an owl and right. i find the same thing with music i do it all you know audibly sort of i'm crafting music to make it sound right and so I always have this thing in my head that, oh, I've got to make the vocals right. And it suddenly struck me when I was listening to this pre-master version and went, I don't like, it's not that I don't like the vocal anymore, but the vocal didn't develop in the way that the music had developed. The vocal had stayed mm. static, whereas everything musically had developed and, and developed. Oh, interesting. And I, and I suddenly went, I think I'm going to have to make two very uncomfortable calls here. One which is to the record company, and one which is to Haley. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> uh, Haley, I'm afraid I need you to re-sing it. She said, "What is it? A couple of words? You need a couple of different notes?" I said, "No, I need, I've re rewritten it." And I spent a couple of days going, "Right, I'm going to rewrite it." Well, the words were similar because the story was still the same, but it needed to develop more. And so. And that is quite scary doing that that close to the end of a record when you've lived with a piece of music for a long time because you kind of have to take a bit of a chance and actually go, I could get this horribly wrong right. or this could mm. turn out to be you. And then you just have to get to a point where you go, do you know what? You've been doing this long enough now. You have to trust when you think yeah. something isn't right. You have to trust it. And so I trusted it. And I, I listened to it in the car when we were driving out today. And I, I said to my wife at the time, I said, Every time I hear that song, I go, I'm so glad I changed the vocal line. And, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so that that piece of music is particularly special for that because it's, you know, it, it just, it, it did, it was exactly right. It was the right decisions to make. And Haley, Haley, bless her, you know, she just went, yeah, all right. And she said, it, sent it back to me and it sounded wonderful. She sang it absolutely beautifully. That's great. Before we go on to the new movie soundtrack question, um, how about the part of Peter's question? Which song came out closest to how you envision the whole thing? Any? It's like it's, <laughs> I, I think they probably all did. In or yeah. they sort of exceeded what I wanted them to do because you you write them, um, and they're telling a story, and, and the story is important. But then when people, what's it, the, the best way? putting this when i when i write i, I tend to be a bit um i'm not going to say control freak but i tend to write when i write a piece of music i'm writing a lot of the parts for people mm -hmm. so i'm writing a lot of the pipe parts i'm writing a lot of the violin parts and i'm writing a lot of the, the obviously vocal lines and, and the guitar bits and stuff and so i tend to, to write a lot of these bits or because i'm producing it as well i'm working closely with people to make sure i get what i want yeah and what is always wonderful for me is it, it's not 
it's about the musicians that you have. It's not about getting them to be able to perform exactly what you wanted I, identically. It's about them doing that little bit, that extra 10%, that you they give you 90% of what you want, which would be perfect. But then they do that bit that they do because they are experts in their craft. Yeah. And they do something that make you go, oh, brilliant. I'd never have thought that's what you've just done there. You yeah. Know, Haley does a couple of things where she she sings a, a line in an emotive way that I would never get being in a guide vocalist. You know, yeah. I would never have been able to get across that that thing. And you're trying to direct what you want. And she sends you something back and you go, oh, that's better than I can imagine. And Oliver Day would often, at the end of a take of a load of stuff that I wanted, he'd say, oh, and there's a couple of minutes of noodling away. And I'd go through all these noodles and go, that's beautiful, Oliver. How can we not, we've got to use that. And so awesome. and it's the same with Troy. Troy sent me one bit. He said, oh, I've done this. He said, there's a bit you're going to throw away. He said, I went nuts and did a bit of a flute solo. And um, and I sort of listened to it and thought, it's the oh, best that's, part, right? that's wonderful. Where can I use that? You know, so it's it's those things that the other musicians bring yeah. that uh, elevate the project beyond where I imagined it could get to. And that's the thing that I, I love most about working with other musicians. It's not the fact that they can copy and play what I've roughly played and make it sound clean and, and, and better. Right. It's the fact that they just, they bring this, this little sparkle that really good musicians can do. Yeah. And so that, so that, that, that sort of, so they sort of all ended up how I wanted them to be, but, but, where the i art, wanted them to be yeah. yeah the art and magic of collaboration is yeah. shining right through there in that example absolutely yeah. and um you know and i know some people find it hard you know being constrained because in, in a band you obviously have a different viewpoint you know bands everybody works on their bit and they work it yeah. together but on a solo record it's slightly different but i you know i do work closely with people they're not just send me that and off they go again and I never see them again. I, you know, we talk all the time and we, we chat and, you know, there's a, there's a real camaraderie around the yeah. record as well. Yeah, for sure. And you were recently involved with a film soundtrack. What can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I don't know where it's going to come out yet, but it's, um, I got approached uh, through my management, uh, from their management by, um, for a, it's an independent film. It's a director's mm. first film called Diamond Sky um characterization type film based around a couple of uh young people who live a bit of a fantasy life um of, di of being diamond thieves and it was it was oh, great wow. it was lovely lovely to do they they wrote to me and said you know would you be interested and i said yeah send send me the send me the film across and um so i got the film and started watching it and it's it's an interesting experience writing music for film. I did it for, for Yendor, the, the Rodney Matthews film. That was a, that's a shorter film. And suddenly you're sort of looking at this and, you know, you, you're sort of watching a film stripped back. There's there's no Foley, there's no sound effects, there's no right. music, you know, there's road noise, there's all the other stuff that's going on. Yeah, and you're wrong. trying to go, okay. And so you have to focus on, you really have to focus in on the character. And and that's what I love about writing is that you're, you know, having done a lot of rock opera stuff where you're writing to books, you are focusing on the characters and you're going, okay, so he's this type of character. He's got a bit of an edge to him. So what can I do musically? And it's like, okay, if we do that, but then if we actually augment that note and make it pass, we're going to get a bit of a bit of an edge. And it was like, okay, that works. And then it goes, cuts to this scene when he sees the girl that he, 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 he sort of likes Right. And suddenly this little refrain came and suddenly, and I sent it to them and I said, look, I've come up with a couple of ideas and sent it to them. And they just came straight back and said, that's amazing. That's, that has captured those people perfectly. What can you do with this scene? And then we sort of jumped in and out of the, of the film. We worked on the principle that a film sort of has three elements that work together. You've sort of got the dialogue, you've got the imagery and you've got the music. And those are the three things. And at any one point, you've got one of them taking the dominant part with a secondary yeah. one, which is helping. And then the third one is probably lower down at that point. So you'll have bits where the music is just an underscore, just coming underneath, filling out the sound. 
Yeah. Other bits where the music and the imagery is important, but there's no dialogue. Other bits where you're working, it might be a static scene, but the dialogue is really important. And then the music has to raise the tension. And I sort of, I said, we, we talked about the film and said, well, we need to think about, we talked about it like tent poles. We talked about it like, you know, there's bits where the music has got to be a tent pole and actually carry it from one place to another. And there's bits where we've got to be, you know, much less and so i didn't sort of sit and start writing a film from the beginning and work my way through you you jump around and, and try and understand the scenes uh which was great and um you know they wanted something quite minimalist at times mm. which was challenging for someone like me um so it's it's, it's more subdued than i would have done uh, than i've done in the past um but then there was other sections where they said oh we we want this here and they said, oh, we, we want this section where they do this. They go through this museum to steal something. Uh, can you do something that's really underscory and a bit menacing? And, of course, I just went away and wrote something orchestral and sent it to the <laughs> 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 It sounds like a fun film, too. Yeah. I love the story yeah. idea. Yeah. And they came back and said, um, that wasn't what we expected at all. But it's great. that <laughs> You would never have never have thought of that. And so there's a couple of these moments in the film where – it was a lovely collaborative process where they would sometimes make me strip music back. And there'll be times where I said, no, you, ah. you can't do that. You've got to take this bit to way beyond where you think it needs to go. Oh, nice. And, and it was lovely. So we actually ended up, you know, working in the way a, a band does, you know, you're trying yeah. to get the rise in you. And, and it's, it's lovely because in the same way with a, with a record where you're always trying to, the song is king. It's not a showboating. Yeah. Band effort for me records it's it's the song is king and in the film it was always the story is king what what helps the story um, right. so it was yeah so it's a really really interesting um thing to do i think you know there's a chance there might be another one that's uh, awesome i'll do at some point so so that was that was really good fun really enjoyed it um yeah and it got it was you know it was an opportunity as well to play with lots of synths and lots of different filter effects and things that i often don't get to play with so it was um yeah different type different type of project again and, and doing that whilst doing the anam cara thing was lovely because it was like completely different you know disciplines to work yeah with. yeah uh, so no so it was good it was good fun and as soon as i know where it will be coming out it'll be um I'll let everybody know, but I got invited to the, the the private screening up at BAFTA the other day, which was nice. So I went down to right. London and um, got to sit in a very comfy cinema chair. <laughs> <laughs> you got a big popcorn. thing of popcorn. I thought yeah, that was. Yeah, a, yeah, I didn't think they'd appreciate that so much in BAFTA. I thought that might have been a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we're very excited that we're going to have you as our special guest, not only for performance, not only for fan Q and A, but for both on April twentieth. That's going to be noon Pacific U.S., three p.m. Eastern U.S., and eight p.m. by that time after the time change in the U.K. And folks, if you go to the link that's into the description of this post for DrumTalkTVBrilliance.com, yes, we feature more than just drummers. Big thing happening in that department really soon. But um, like tomorrow, we're having Derek Shulman of General Giant. He's going to answer questions not only about the prog scene of the time, but him being the president, CEO, and AR of Polygram Records, Adco Records, Roadrunner Records, what he's doing now with 2 Plus Music and Entertainment. You'll have a chance to see an exclusive performance by Oliver. We're not even going to ask what he's going to play. Uh, we want to be surprised as well. And then have some time to do Q&A. This will be in one of our virtual 3D amphitheaters. We've got seven. I haven't decided which one we're going to use yet, but you don't need special goggles or anything like that. You can access it on your mobile phone, tablet, PC, laptop, and navigate wherever you want to watch the show from. Or if you're old school, like Jeff, our president, you can just click a button and see it in 2D full screen. And we're really excited about that, Oliver. And we'll be in touch, of course, before then. And we've got that uh, sound run through a few days before as well. Yeah. Great. Keep us posted. And if you have anything big you want to talk about before that on Yes Shift, you're always more than welcome. Oh, fantastic. I, I, I certainly, well, I don't know what I'm going to play yet either. I've got no idea at all. 
<laughs> uh, well, well, you've got time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, got time. Some time. Uh, with your mountain of available time in the meantime to figure it out. But hang, yeah. hang out for a minute with Steve and I so we can compare Seinfeld notes. And folks, thank you so much for following what we do here on Yes Shift and Drum Talk TV. And we will see you again soon.